Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ed Arnold and I'm Vice President of Products here at Leverage Point. I'd like to welcome all of you to another one of our monthly webinars of thought leadership in value-based strategy. Sponsored by Leverage Point. Leverage Point provides the only software solution for value-based pricing. We offer a cloud-based collaboration platform that supports product innovation as well as sales enablement that changes the way companies create, communicate, and capture value. Find out more about us from our website, leveragepoint.com. Now, during the webinar, if you have any specific questions or comments, please feel free to enter them in the right-hand panel in the question section, and later in the webinar, we'll get to them, uh, get through as many of them as we can. So before I introduce today's speaker, uh, we'd like to ask our audience, a quick polling question. So please uh, indicate, we're really interested in, in, in hearing where, how far your company has gone in adopting a value-based selling strategy. So please select one of these five choices, either A, actively engaged, B, starting to shift to, C, researching how to start, uh, or D, researching whether or not to start, or unsure. So if you can take a moment and select one of these, and uh, as I do the introduction uh, of the speaker, we, we will tabulate and then share the results. So today's speaker, uh, we're very delighted to have with us, once again, noted pricing thought leader and author, Chris Probines. And Chris is a healthcare and medical technology expert, has over 20 years of industry experience, and has held executive positions at Johnson & Johnson and Siemens Healthcare. And currently, he runs his own consultancy called Value Vantage Partners, where he shares his expertise and trains global clients in the areas of strategic pricing, value selling, and sales negotiation. He's also an author of multiple books on the topic of strategic pricing in the healthcare space, including the most recent one called Healthcare Value Selling, and there'll be some more information about that book later in the webinar. Uh, Chris is also a popular adjunct professor at Rutgers University. Now, I know there's a lot of folks out there today who are very eager to hear what Chris has to say about winning with a new healthcare buyer. So with that, welcome, Chris. Thank you, Ed. It's great to be here. Yes. Yeah, so, Chris, um, we'd like to see the results of the poll right now, and they should be up on the screen. So it looks like we have uh, a pretty sophisticated audience right now. The majority of folks are actively engaged in value-based selling um, with uh, a large number uh, starting to shift to that. So you, you have a pretty uh, experienced crew today, Chris. Oh, that's fabulous. That's great. All right. Well, you may begin. Great. Well, thanks, Ed. Thanks for the Leverage Point team for uh, allowing me to speak today, but most of all, thanks to you all for being on the uh, webinar. Um, so it's great to see that you're all actively, or most of you are actively engaged in um, doing value selling. And of course, the health care market is rapidly changing and forcing everyone to do this. So this is, uh, it's great to see everyone moving in that direction. So today in our short 25 minutes together, what we hope to do is really give you some background on this changing marketplace and key trends. We'll talk about the emergence of what I call the new buyer. This is really a much more sophisticated, committee-based uh, buyer who's emerging in healthcare and what the implications are for suppliers. And we'll share some winning frameworks. We probably won't have time to go through each of these in great detail, uh, but you will get a copy of the slides afterwards, so you will have uh, the slides as well as some of the content there. But we hope to get into quantifying your value and connecting it really what's becoming increasingly important is connecting it to the customer's business as well as reimbursement model. Align your value selling to the customer's buying behavior and the buying cycle. Uh, talk about how to defend your value against uh, tough buyers who are emerging and the objections that they have, and really how to leverage your value and negotiate differently with procurement as well as uh, navigate buying committees. 
Okay, so with that, let's get started. So as we talked about before, I've been in healthcare for about uh, 24 years. And uh, in that time, I think many of you uh, who've been in healthcare for a while would probably agree that we've seen just in the past two years, probably more change than we saw in the previous decade. So things with the Affordable Care Act in the U.S. at least are rapidly changing. We know outside the U.S. are rapidly changing. So I think one of the areas that's most impacted is how our customers, so providers, healthcare providers like hospitals, surgical centers, and others, how they're changing their buying behavior. So in the past, it's fair to say we used to have this situation where you had more clinician or physician-driven buying where they really controlled most of the buying decision and really administration really wasn't terribly involved. Obviously, that's a generalization. Uh, today, we have really a growing sophistication and a really value-focused buyer in the healthcare marketplace is forcing hospitals to really think about value and integrate it into how they run their businesses. And the question really becomes, what's the future? And what does it, this new buyer mean to your marketing team and to, your, importantly, your sales team, who I think are seeing the most change and the most pressure as a result of all these changes? So I like to talk about these changes in the context of really what's the drivers, what's causing this change to happen. So if you bring it down to the pressure we all see on suppliers, there's really 10 key drivers of change. You might be able to bucket these in different buckets, but what I like to talk about is these 10. And let's start in the upper left-hand quadrant. So if you take value-based purchasing and accountable care in the U.S., these are specific reimbursement programs and new business models that are really pushing our customers to focus on three things, uh, cost, quality, and outcomes and really causing them to be accountable, not just for the acute episode of care, but also thinking about what is the total episode cost of that patient, not just the acute event, but downstream costs as well. And we'll talk about in a little while about them being held accountable for costs, and it's not just in the hospital, but when a patient leaves the hospital. So that's having an impact on suppliers. The next two are physician employment and aligned incentives. So depending on what study you look at, there's lots of projections out there about the percentage of physicians who will be employed by hospitals in the next few years. And this, of course, varies by specialty. It varies by parts of the region of the country. But it's fair to say it's going to be a widespread employment of uh, many physicians in the future, and they're increasingly employed now. And that obviously changes how they think about and how they buy products and services from suppliers. So uh, as one CFO of a hospital told me, uh, in the past, physicians were uh, practicing on their own and really, not they didn't care about the hospital, but were, was less interested in the hospital financials. Now, with physicians being employed and with aligned incentives, there's a shared destiny. So they're working much closely together on outcomes and cost and quality. The next two drivers of change, if you go to the right-hand side of the slide, are transparency and supply chain disruptors. And so with the Internet and big data, we're seeing a emergence of transparency in a number of areas that we'll go into a little more detail on. And this is really causing uh, a change in how customers will buy in the future. Also, there are new supply chain disruptors, new organizations who are putting themselves between the customer and the supplier, and who are bringing on new business models and new ways for customers and suppliers to interact. And this will impact uh, the new buyer, impact how customers buy products and services. And then if you look at the bottom hand of the bottom of the slide, you have consolidation. There's lots of statistics out there about the percentage of hospitals that will be surviving in the next five years. There's lots of projections that we may have 50 or 30 large hospital systems organized by geography that will have an impact on how hospitals buy and the pressure on suppliers. The importantly maturing hospital supply chain, so no matter what statistic you look at uh, in the past, hospitals were really regarded by many people as having probably some of the worst supply chains in an industry. Obviously, there are very, very well run hospital supply chains out there today, but as an industry, it was relatively immature, and that's rapidly changing. So your customers are becoming smarter buyers of goods and services, 
and their purchasing and their supply chain is really maturing. And then lastly, obviously, there's growing evidence needs and new care models emerging. So these are really 10 drivers of change that are putting tremendous pressure on suppliers. It's creating what I call the new buyer, so a much more sophisticated, value-oriented buyer who is really looking for the suppliers to deliver value and articulate their value in new and different ways. So why does value matter with this new buyer? If you look at any study of what's important to hospital executives, usually these top two or three things show up. It's about cost containment. It's about improving quality, maintaining their reimbursement. Of course, with all of the changes in the U.S. with the Affordable Care Act, there are a number of things that are causing cuts in reimbursement, as well as forcing providers to put money on the line in terms of improving quality and improving outcomes. And what they're clearly looking to is looking to their suppliers as being a source of advantage or a source of savings in some cases. So they're really, their expectations of suppliers is increasing. So I mentioned big data and transparency. So when I think about transparency, it's really in three areas. The first is outcomes. And so there are lots of entities working on getting transparency to outcomes. Uh, shared clarity is a joint venture between United Healthcare and three hospital systems in the U.S. They're really looking to bring transparency to outcomes for very expensive procedures and medical uh, devices. Other health technology assessment agencies around the world are also looking at bringing increased transparency on outcomes. So this is really to help them as a better buyer think about what are the right devices, which of the alternative devices or supplies or equipment or methods are the best ones for them to achieve optimal outcomes at the lowest possible cost. The next area of uh, transparency is value. So you have had group purchasing organizations involved in this. Obviously, there's third-party benchmarking organizations uh, that provide some feature-based benchmarking, things like MD byline and EPRI. Uh, you also have new entities entering the space. So you have a company like what I have that little logo on there, Procured Health. Procured Health is a startup. It's been around for a couple of years. Uh, what they're trying to do, it's a very interesting strategy and one that probably will prove very successful is they are trying to help hospitals really enable their value analysis process through their value analysis committees, and what they provide are tools as well as a cloud-based platform to do value analysis. Uh, so why is that important? Why should you care as a supplier? Well, one hospital could go out and do a value analysis of your products or solutions, and that may go, let's say that goes against you as a supplier, and they recommend not choosing you as a supplier but your competitor. Well, that hospital could go, go and post that value analysis on a cloud-based platform and any hospital that belongs to this uh, service could get visibility to that value analysis. So in a way, it's spreading the message. So if the value analysis is very favorable for you, that's great, right? So it's almost like paid advertising. If the value analysis goes against you, uh, then you can see that trickle across the country for all the hospitals that are part of this network. So I think this has real implications for suppliers to really control the value message. And then the last area of transparency, of course, is pricing. You have the Government Accountability Office through Congress who started to do studies in this area in the U.S. for expensive implantable devices. You have other governments around the world who are starting to do some form of price transparency or price referencing uh, with the cost pressure on the health system. And if you just focus on medical devices and diagnostics, uh, somewhere around 300 to $400 billion dollars is spent around the world in medical devices and diagnostics and other supplies, excluding pharmaceuticals. And when you have that amount of spend with the amount of pressure we have in health systems around the world, you're going to have lots of entities trying to make a go and play here. So there's lots of new startups working in this space. So transparency should be a big concern for all suppliers these days. And of course, that'll be leveraged by uh, buyers. So why do hospitals care about supply chain and supply chain costs? Here is a typical hospital budget or financial breakout. You can see most of their costs are in their people costs, employee benefits, and wages. 
But importantly, depending on the study you look at, somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of their costs are supply costs, and you see the breakout on the right. What's important to understand is they view and oftentimes view their labor as being fixed. So when they need to save money, which they all need to do right now, uh, they turn to suppliers who they view as uh, a, a very important lever to help take costs out. Uh, the other reason why this is important for them to get much better at supply chain is because uh, they expect that with innovation, uh, the continued innovation that they'll see supply costs increase over time. And also hospitals uh, are importantly outsourcing many of their functions. So increasingly you'll see goods and services as a percentage of their total spend increase over time as they do more outsourcing and take on more advanced technology. So that's why they're investing and becoming smarter buyers of goods and services. The other thing that's really pushing us in the direction of them becoming smarter, of course, is healthcare reform. So here's a simple slide that illustrates uh, some of the elements of healthcare reform, as well as some of the traditional elements. And so if you go on the vertical axis, this is the degree of financial risk that a hospital has in provider. If you go on the horizontal, this is the cost included. So if you look what's happened here is what CMS or the government's trying to push the providers to do is move out of this seek of service arrangement to more of a capitated model. So they're putting in these programs. So uh, they always have had DRGs or APCs. They put in HACs, which is Hospital Fire Conditions Program, and BP is value-based purchasing. They've also put in readmission penalties. MSDP is Medicare Spend Per Beneficiary. This is a new program that will go into effect in October. This is really causing hospitals to look at not only the episode of care, but what is the cost 30 days post-care. Uh, bundle payments is a mechanism for them to align hospitals and physicians and other providers on coordinating care to take costs out. So, again, it's putting more risk in there. And then, of course, accountable care. So depending on what projection you look, look at, there's somewhere around five to 600 accountable care organizations now, about half of those are Medicare. And really, those are rewarding hospitals and other providers for coming together to coordinate care. And uh, importantly, in many of the models, they're taking on increased financial risk and also risk for managing patients, not the episode of care, but the total cost of the patient, the least inpatient and outpatient over a period of time. So this is really causing the buyer to change, the hospital to change how they think about buying goods and services, also importantly changing how they think about you as a supplier and the solutions you can bring. So what does hospital buying look like in the future? Obviously it's accelerating transparency. So if you don't have your act together on pricing and have clear pricing rules and are managing that not only uh, in a local markets, but within regions at least, you could have some issues. It's about really the evolving uh, evolution of the buying decision. So we have much more sophisticated buyers. They are focused much more on economics than they ever have been. Uh, it's more of a committee buying process. And in many, many parts of healthcare or medical technology industry, they're now beginning to accept generics. So generic devices uh, are starting to emerge or have emerged and will probably become more important over time. Of course, along with that, they've done reprocessing of single-use devices, so that's a way for them to get it off. There's a bigger focus on value, so not only the episode of care in a hospital, but importantly, economic and clinical value over time and connecting that to their reimbursement model. And then, of course, uh, no matter what projection you look at, it looks like there'll be increased cost pressures at least for the next five to ten years. So this is hospital buying in the future. It's going to be a much more sophisticated buyer, what I call the new buyer, who's looking at outcomes, who wants to know what is the actual value you bring as uh, not only your products and solutions, but you as a supplier. And they're going to use transparency, and they're going to be under tremendous pressure. Okay, so that's kind of a setup for what we want to talk about now. And in the next 10 minutes or so, we'll go through uh, some information on uh, what's in my new book. So we'll talk about uh, moving to this new world, what's required to be successful. So 
So when you step back and you say, we have this new environment, what does it take to actually be good at pricing and value management? Uh, For me, it really requires execution in six key areas. So if you start at the left-hand part of the slide, it's really about being able to quantify your value and shape reimbursement. The next part, number two, is really setting a clear pricing strategy. Step number three is having a clear offering strategy. So this is just designing your uh, service as well as the different uh, parts of your portfolio in a way that makes sense. Step four is establishing pricing rules and guidelines. Step five is actually executing, managing price, as well as doing the contract management activities. And then this final step is sell and defend value. And if you look across this continuum, uh, obviously there's a couple of insights from this. Uh, A, it starts with value, so you really should understand your value proposition. That's the start of all this. But B, this kind of fits together as a collective system. So in order to actually do this well, you have to, if you really want to capture the value of your solutions and check your margins over time, it's not good enough to be really good at pricing. You also have to be really good at selling your value and defending your value against these new buyers. So that's why this last area has become increasingly important. So step six here, selling and defending value, is now one of the critical levers that companies must really address to be successful in the future. Okay, so when we think about that step number six, it's really, when I think about it and break it down, it's three parts. It's really understanding this new buyer. So there's three parts to this. It's mapping the buying process. So really understanding how does your customer customer buy things. Buying center just means who's involved in the buying decision, what level of influence does each of those people have. Uh, Anticipate buyer sourcing tactics. That simply means understanding how professional buyers think and operate, understand the sourcing strategies they go through. Uh, Navigate buying committees is really now with value analysis teams, with value analysis committees, new technology committees. Being able to understand these entities and navigate them is very important. The other major bucket here is really prepare it to sell and defend value. So there's three elements to this. It's being able to quantify your value and use it smartly during selling. It's about creating flexible offers and trades that allow you to customize your offers to different buyers. And then lastly, it's identifying and leveraging buying behavior. And then finally, the final step in this is really align your tactics to the customer's buying process to know exactly where they are in the buying process and allow your tactics and really learn to recognize and play buyer games, okay? So those are three broad buckets with some steps underneath. We'll delve into a couple of those areas. We don't have enough time to go through uh, each and every one of those today. We could do that on a follow-up webinar, but let's let's touch on a few of these. So first, I talked about understanding the buying process. So I won't go through this in detail, but there's an important point from this. So this is a typical hospital buying process. There's six stages. It starts with problem recognition or opportunity. So someone in the the customer recognizes there's a problem or opportunity the supplier can help with. And then they go through a standard buying process. And what's important to understand in this is what is the customer trying to do along the way here? So... Obviously, in the beginning, they're trying to qualify the opportunity, set clear requirements, and come up with decision criteria for whatever they're buying. In the middle, it's about coming up with a clear sourcing and negotiation strategy. And then at the end, it's really about supply and contract management. So why is this important to understand? Well, if you look at the statistics out there, and I know many of you have probably read the Challenger sale book. Uh, if you go to some of the work that they've done, the corporate executive board, they'll say that uh, roughly 60% of the buying decision is shaped by the time the customer formally engages the supplier. And if someone has worked in purchasing, uh, I can tell you go work, go ask people in purchasing, they would say uh, that's not a surprise. If you look at steps one through six, that's actually for a large part what purchasing people, good purchasing people do for a living. So it shouldn't be a surprise, but the insights from a selling perspective are, of course, if you're on the outside and you're contacted for an RFP that you've had absolutely no involvement with uh, the buyer along the journey, you ought to be thinking about is that a real opportunity. Uh, Likewise, if you're the incumbent supplier and an RFP shows up on your desk, you should be asking yourself, what happened to steps one, two, three, and four? Is this a legitimate bid? 
And uh, if it is, what's going on in the process? Why have you missed it? So really working from a selling perspective early on in the customer's buying process, you should be up there shaping the buying decision so that when the bid comes out, it's actually yours to win. Okay, so that's a high level of that. So what are the steps that align with that? So the top of this is the six buying steps I talked about. So what do you have to do from a value selling standpoint? Obviously, in the beginning, it's problem recognition and analysis. So this is really about teaching the customer, highlighting your value, being able to influence members of the buying center. In the middle, it's about shaping the buying criteria, leveraging the influencers, and being able to defend your value appropriately. And then lastly, obviously, at the end, if you're the incumbent supplier, you should be reinforcing your value proposition. So one of the simple things to ask is uh, of your sales team, or if you're in sales, ask yourself this question, is how, how formal is my process of the incumbent supplier to spend time with my customer to reinforce my value proposition through business reviews? I can tell you, having worked in purchasing, and I know people in purchasing, that uh, if you're not doing that, they're not going to recognize the value that you're bringing. It's easy to forget what the supplier is doing to you. Okay, so if you take the step number three there, it says determine the strategic sourcing strategy. If you were to dive deep on that, uh, here is how the customer views what they buy. So if you go to any large hospital system, they might buy 10,000 to 15,000 supply items. The smart ones will take those and put those into categories and they'll manage those as categories. So uh, one hospital system I know has taken those 10,000 supply items and they put them into 300 categories. And then what they do is they plot them on a map like this. So let me explain this map for you. This is how they determine their sourcing strategy. So on the vertical axis is how much money they spend on that category spend. So the category of spam could be sutures, it could be spinal implants, it could be a particular drug in a therapeutic area, it could be diagnostic equipment, right? So it's not the price of that, uh, the, that stuff, it's actually what they spend in terms of the budget impact. On the bottom, you see on the horizontal is really the supply characteristics. So without going into detail on all of these, if you're over to the right, your supply area has a lot of stickiness and it's hard to switch. If you're over to the left, it's relatively easy to switch. So how do the buyers think about their, their sourcing strategy and how do they develop their sourcing strategy to deal with you? If you are up in the upper left-hand quadrant, so they spend lots of money on your supplies, but it's relatively easy to switch, you would be called a commodity in their eyes. If you are in the upper right-hand quadrant, and so you, they spend a lot of money on what you have, but you have some stickiness, it's harder to switch, you'd be considered strategic. If you're in the lower right-hand quadrant, you would be lower spend but hard to switch. And then if you're over to the left, you would be a lower spend amount but relatively easy to switch. And so what they will do is develop a specific sourcing strategy depending on where your products fall on this two-by-two, two, and that's how they attack the marketplace. So understanding, importantly, how the customer views what's in your sales bag and putting it on a map like this is really important. So we talked a bit about value. We'll do a quick overview. So value in healthcare is really about these three areas. So when we talk about communicating value to this new buyer, it's about really emotional value, which is those two things. It's about economic, and it's about clinical value. And of course, value doesn't exist unless you are different than the competitor next best alternative. So let's go through a quick quantification example. I'm sure based on the poll and the earlier results, Sounds like you're all pretty sophisticated, so this is probably an um, old hat for you. But if you had a quantified value, let's say you had a uh, solution that increased OR capacity, one of the things you could do is identify your performance differences. So if the customer's need was increased OR capacity, you would identify your performance difference. Let's say in this case, your, your device allows you to speed up OR cycle time by 30%. What you want to do is gather the customer impact. In this case, it says you can perform five additional procedures per week. You want to understand what each of those procedures is worth. And then bottom step would be to quantify the economic value. Now, of course, this kind of fits in with the old reimbursement world. The complexity of the new world requires you to think about this in the context of who is the payer for that patient. 
and what is the business model or payment model for the hospital. So in many cases, this is the right kind of value story to tell. In some cases, they don't want to do more procedures and they don't want to do more testing. So depending on their payment model, uh, this could be a good or bad value story. Okay, so the other key point is in this new world, when you have buying committees, you have new influences you have to talk to. So the dark blue are probably the old ones that many people have talked to in the past, in the future, or now we have to talk to all of these light blue ones as well. And of course, the expectations from these groups is increased dramatically in terms of uh, both their influence as well as what they expect from suppliers. The other key point to think about from a value perspective is depending on who you're talking to, your value focus may be very different or their focus on value may be very different. So a department in the hospital will have a different value focus than the hospital itself, who may have a very different focus than the accountable care organization and may be different than the insurer or health system. And the complexity of the marketplace that's happening, of course, is hospitals becoming insurers and APOs, and APOs and insurers are sometimes getting involved in the hospital business. So this top part of this chart is becoming blurred a bit based on changes in the marketplace. And then finally, one of the things you should do if you haven't done already uh, to deal with this new buyer is all of these various programs that are laid out here, whether it's readmission penalties, hospital acquired conditions, value-based purchasing, whether it's bundled payments or accountable care, is to take each of your specific key offerings and really go through and try to identify where do you have real differences that impact the customer's payment model based on these new reimbursement mechanisms. Uh, and look for real differences because in the conversations and the interviews I've done with hospital C-suite personnel, particularly with finance personnel, what is very clear is if you do have advantages, they want to hear about it. So to the extent you can prove readmission penalties, you can impact value-based purchasing, or you, you can impact accountable care in a unique or different way than your competition, they want to hear about that. So final thoughts, really the marketplace is moving quickly. It's moving quicker than I think a lot of suppliers are, but there are a lot of smart suppliers who are really moving quickly and keeping up with the change. Uh, in the future, I think no group, at least currently in, in the near term, is under more pressure or more, more uh, stress uh, with this change than I think the sales team. And the sales team, because of all this change, really requiring an evolution not only in the sales model, but also thinking about what are the skills and the competency sales teams need to help their companies win and help them personally to win in the future. Okay, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Ed. All right, well, thank you very much, Chris. That was a great presentation, uh, some real rich content there. And just to let our participants know, we'll be making the slides available as well as a recording of this broadcast, because I'm sure uh, people are gonna wanna have a copy uh, of these slides. Uh, now, we do have some questions that have come in uh, during your presentation. And by the way, um, there is still time to put your question in the list. It's on the right-hand panel again, question section. Uh, we'll put them, uh, we'll, we'll add those. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit about how LeveragePoint helps scale the types of uh, value conversations or selling value that Chris talked about and how our customers use the platform. So to begin with, LeveragePoint is a cloud-based application that allows everyone in the enterprise to efficiently collaborate on a number of value-based activities. And when we say efficient, that means everything is in one place where people can organize it and reuse it. Now this enables the, the product marketing and pricing teams to understand value, build out value. So some of the things that Chris was talking about quantifying the value, looking at that across stakeholders, et cetera, uh, is all together and uh, allows them to make better strategic decisions. And then after those decisions have been made, there's a content repository for customer-facing teams uh, to have material that gives them a lot more confidence in communicating uh, the, that differentiation. And because everything's on a platform, you have both sides linked together. So you have a mechanism for continuous improvement to gather the latest field intelligence, and that's a great advantage for large organizations to scale. 
All right, so let's get into the questions, and um, a few of them have come in. Uh, so the first one, Chris, uh, it's more of a factual one. It's what percentage of U.S. physicians are hospital employed today, and what is the projection in five to ten years? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. There, there's actually some controversy over both of these numbers. Uh, so there's consulting firms that have put out numbers um, that are somewhere projecting somewhere, I think, in, in the 80% will be employed uh, in the next two years. If you look at, there was a study published by the American Medical Association, so AMA, published something last fall that basically said these statistics are off and they've done a fairly good job of doing it by specialty in the U.S. So um, I don't recall the AMA overall. It was, it was much less than the overall projections. So uh, if you just do a Google of AMA physician employment trends, you should be able to get that study. But if you can't find it, just email me and I'll be happy to uh, send you a copy. I have it somewhere on my desktop. Uh, but it, it is it is murky in terms of what the actual stat is, but I think everyone agrees on that it is increasing and that it probably will continue to increase over time. All right, very good. Okay, um, next question. Um, what is MSBP? It must have been on one of your slides. Yeah, MSBP is a, uh, it's part of the Medicare value-based purchasing program. It's Medicare spend per beneficiary. And all that really is, is, uh, you know, in the past, Medicare used to pay by DRG, so diagnosis-related group, or APC, ambulatory payment category classification, whether you're inpatient or outpatient. But they've gotten smarter, and they've realized that uh, some hospitals will do staging of procedures, some will have bad outcomes, and then Medicare will have to spend lots of money on an outpatient side. So basically what Medicare is doing starting October 1st of this year, so it's the Medicare 2015 fiscal year, is they're going to be paying, uh, they're going to be measuring and tracking this. So they will track three days prior to an inpatient admission and then 30 days post admission and they'll look at the total cost for caring for that patient and then what they're going to do is compare that to all like patients and they're going to come up with an index for the hospital so like everything cms does it sounds very complicated right uh, but basically hospitals who have a lower cost a lower spend ratio compared to their peers will get rewarded and hospitals who have a higher cost relative to the peers will get penalized so the important point for suppliers to think about is if you have a solution that, let's say, reduces downstream costs, has fewer follow-ups, fewer radiology visits, whatever it is after an inpatient admission, then you should be really communicating that and using that as a key selling point in the future, really trying to quantify what does it mean for the hospital. Okay. Um, so here's an interesting question. Uh, with supplier-side sophistication, aren't we in a world where value sellers compete against other value sellers? Well, what yeah, happens when everyone is selling on value? <laughs> hopefully the person with the best value story wins, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a great question. At least in my experience, is there's a real wide range of uh, capabilities in terms of organizations, even those competing against each other. And many of the specialties and disease states have really widely varying capabilities in this area. Um, so if, if you're all selling the same widget or same solution with the same exact outcomes, and you're all trying to sell value, obviously, you know, it sounds like there's not differentiation, right? But things are always differentiated, whether it's your product, whether it's your services, whether it's your brand, your reputation. What uh, will become increasingly important is not just the value of the widget, but what you bring as a supplier. So as buyers get more sophisticated and they think about you as a supplier, they're going to be thinking about not just buying a widget, I'm going to have a transactional relationship with you, but many of them will want to be seek out value in a valuable relationship. And so you'll be able to differentiate and, and tell the value of the relationship of you as a company as well and what that actually means to the customer. Now, obviously, not all segments of customers will value that. There's a certain segment that will value that. 
Um, but you will always be differentiated in some way, and it's up to you to find that hook and communicate that to customers. Yeah, I, I, re I really like that. I really like that answer. And, and if, if just to add my own thought to that is, I think the value seller who really understands their customer best, it has the advantage. Because a lot of times, um, one, of, one of the obstacles is really lack of knowledge or not having enough deep knowledge about how customers use or benefit from your, your offering. Um, I think that could be one way of differentiating against different value sellers. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, you know, I'd agree. I'd also think about um, there's lots of instances, and we have lots of case studies in healthcare, right, where someone comes out with a better, with an inferior product at a higher price and grabs market share from an incumbent because they've outmarketed them. And it's not until over time that people figure out through clinical studies and through uh, uh, comparative effectiveness studies that actually these two things are exactly the same or actually the, the person who's stealing share actually has an inferior product. So uh, marketing matters, selling matters, obviously. I think the other point I'd make is if you go back to the buying process of the, of the customer, I think the reason why this is so important to understand is if you're working at the very beginning stages of the buying process and you're in there and your competition isn't, you have the possibility to shape what they want in their buying criteria. So uh, you, you could, through your efforts by outselling your competition, actually shape the criteria in a way that favors you. And there's lots of case studies of this happening. I know suppliers do in Europe, for example, which is under tender rules, uh, where they have to put out public tenders that are very well uh, organized and very well sp spelled out. What smart sellers do is work 12 to 18 months well in advance make sure that the customer really understands the value of their solution. They try to highlight where they're different so that that ends up in the, the tender requirements. So that same kind of formality is moving into some of the buying in the U.S. Yeah. So I know we're in overtime right now, but we still have some, some additional questions and, and a number of people are, are staying on. So we'll, we'll, let, it, we'll let them roll. Um, so next question is, um, it's referring to one of your slides where you, where you had the quadrant that showed uh, spend versus product loyalty. And the specific question is, you know, for a company with 10,000 plus products, how do you suggest tackling the categorization? Yes, I think that probably referring to the uh, strategic sourcing uh, two by two I had on there. So. Yeah, on the vertical axis is how much money they spend on supplies. On the horizontal is basically the stickiness of the supply category, so what level of position preference. There you go. So it's up on the screen right now. Um, yeah, so th this is a typical challenge lots of suppliers have is what I would try to do is think about how the customer buys your products. So they probably don't buy each 10,000 individually. My guess is, you know, if you're selling sutures with 5,000 product codes or if you have uh, IVD or something like that with five or 10,000 product codes, the customer is probably buying your products in a way by category. It might be overall sutures. If you're selling sutures as an example, what I would try to do, what's usually helpful, is to categorize your products into like buckets and then put them on a chart like this because that's probably what the customer is doing. So you have to – this is – this is not your lens. This lens, you see this slide number 18, is really the customer's lens. And it's not uncommon for suppliers to have a, a portfolio of products that spread all over the map here. And then, obviously, you should be asking yourself the question is, does that create leverage for me? So if I have a very highly differentiated product that is maybe strategic, and I have a bunch of others that are over in the commodity and I'm, uh, in the buckets of products, if I do some kind of clever price bundling of some kind or offering bundling, is that a way for me to actually protect or drive my business? So, so that's the way I would use this type of chart. But you, you can do it, take the 10,000 items and put them in the categories or do a simple Pareto analysis and, and stop at the most important ones and forget the rest. Okay. Next question. How have the market changes impacted the way executives view and address non-clinical costs? Could, could you repeat that one more time, Ed? I'm sorry. 
Sure. How have market changes impacted the way executives view and address non-clinical costs? Oh, so Both, that's a great. Yeah. So you're talking about the non-supply stuff. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to the uh, the, uh, the typical uh, hospital P and L or the cost breakout I showed, obviously if you if you go into the news or do a quick search, you see hospitals are have gone through lots of layoffs over the past year. So they're really addressing the people costs, the infrastructure. Um, so they're attacking that cost part of it. If you look at uh, within uh, employee benefits, as they become smarter buyers of goods and services, one of the things the purchasing people do is they get involved in employee benefits and really start sourcing those in a different way. And the big bucket on that slide, if you look under goods and services to the, to the right, where it's 52% non-clinical supplies, those are things like, uh, you know, it could be food service, it could be all kinds of stuff like in the hospital, but they are attacking that as well. So. Uh, I, I think they are equal opportunity attacking things. Uh, they're trying to find money wherever they can. I think suppliers have been or are now a target because if you look at the orange box on the slide that says physician preference, remember this is an area that they had a real hard time getting their arms around from an administrative standpoint up until recently. This is where the physicians had a lot of stickiness and it was hard to get physicians uh, to to basically work with the hospital to drive costs out. Uh, but a lot of that is changing, and that's why they are really heavily focused on what I call PPI, physician profit items. Okay. So here's a question about uh, sort of the structure of the healthcare industry. Uh, with only 30 to 50 systems left within the next 10 years, would it be important to segment the customers in any, fa- in any fashion, or will it not matter since they've been merging? And I guess they're talking about for-profit, not-profit, academic community. Yeah, I, I think customer segmentation will always be important because um, I, I like to think about this in terms of how they buy. So I, I come at this from more of the, the customer supply side, so what's their buying behavior as an organization. And let's say even if the market shakes out, there's 50 very large systems across the U.S. dominating the marketplace um, in, in five years. There's still going to be sprinkles of little hospitals out there, little rural hospitals, right? Uh, but each of those 50 will buy in a different way. It'll depend on their local marketplace. Uh, the, the 50 may be competing against each other and overlapping territories. Uh, importantly, what you all probably have, if you've been around healthcare for a little while, you probably have seen many of them are moving away from their GPO and creating their own uh, local buying groups. So this is a big trend that these systems are coming together either uh, individually or with other IDNs in the region and creating their own new buying groups. And in many cases, they're using the GPOs to run the back office stuff. They're really driving decision making on their own. But I think uh, a big picture is they're all going to buy a little differently, but you can categorize them by like buying behavior and then have some segmentation approach. All right. So uh, one last question. Can you give an example of what an offer might look like based on a hospital's payment model? Based on their payment model, so it's a it's a good question. So if I have, um, you know, when I think about the offering, and I didn't have a slide on this, it's really four parts. It's your core product or service. It's enabling technologies. Those just help the core product work better or different. Uh, there are services and there are business terms. So one simple way to change the offering strategy that a lot of companies are looking into, and some companies are actually piloting is around the business terms in creating risk-based contracting. And so what uh, many companies are either exploring or actually piloting or testing the waters on is if I'm targeting a standalone hospital who's not part of an ACO as an example, I may not target them with an offering that includes a risk-based contract, but if I'm targeting a hospital as part of a large ACO, I might be working at the ACO mothership level and working on some kind of risk reward based contract to really lock in a patient subset and go at risk with the provider since the provider is at risk with Medicare or the payer ultimately. So that's just a simple example of changing the office guys. All right, great. 
So I think that's all the time we have left for today. And again, we'll be sharing slides from this presentation with all of you soon. Uh, please feel free to send any follow-up questions or comments either to Chris directly or to us and our contact information is in that last slide. And again, just a reminder, please do the survey at the end of the webinar and you'll get a chance to win a copy of Chris's book. And uh, our look forward, uh, you, sh you should be getting a, an upcoming announcement uh, about our next webinar in April. Uh, we're still finalizing the details from that, but um, some information will be coming out soon. So uh, I want to thank Chris again for his time today and for some really great content and some real great uh, responses to the questions. Thank you, Ed. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Until next time.